like to thank the organizers for organizing such a wonderful, stimulating conference in such a gorgeous place, and hopefully I can get out there hiking soon, <laughs> which is a good, good, bad, no, no, not now, I was told I couldn't, <laughs> but um, I wanted to talk today about um, L2 cohomology and the theory of weights. Um, the title is meant to be vague. There isn't any specific theory of weights I want to talk about. The point is, is that there have been various notions of weight that play um, a role in many old results about L2 cohomology, and I wanted to um, discuss and introduce some of those various notions and explain the role that they played, and um, hopefully, if I have time, uh, discuss a possible new approach. So let me begin, um, though, by uh, briefly recalling what I mean by L2 cohomology. So, um, L2 cohomology. So, um, X will be a Ramanian manifold. And um, <laughs> we'll use the, uh, and, and phi is a differential form, say, on X. Then using the Ramanian manifold, we get a metric on the cotangent bundle and hence on the uh, wedge power. And so we can look at the pointwise nor norm squared of this form. We also get a volume form. And then we can impose the condition that we want the L2 norm of this to be finite. And then we can look at a complex, however, um, right this way. And these are phi such that uh, the L2 norm, so this is L2 norm of phi, the L2 norm of phi, and the L2 norm of its exterior derivative are, bo are both less than zero. And then the L2 cohomology is going to be um, the cohomology of this complex. So um, <clears throat> right off the bat, it sh I should make clear a number of things. L2 cohomology is not a topological invariant. It very much can depend upon the metric. And it may, in fact, be infinite dimensional. I'll just remark that two things. Number one, you can pass, instead of smooth forms, to, uh, to measurable forms or distribution forms. And you ex can extend D to um, say, the maximal closed extension. And having done that, we get that the L2 cohomology, which is the kernel of this extension of D modulo the range, I can rewrite that as the kernel of D modulo the closure of the range, direct sum the closure of the range, modulo the range. And so this term here is infinite dimensional or hopefully zero. And this term, on the other hand, is represented by harmonic forms. And I'll remark, as in most of the examples I'm going to be talking about, if x is complete, then this term over here is equal to the L2 harmonic forms. L2 harmonic forms. And there's no boundary conditions. So most of what I'll be talking about really applies to a situation where we have a complete metric. Um, so one interesting situation to consider is where one has a compactification of x. So x might equal the regular point of some algebraic variety. V is a projective algebraic variety over C. And it's expect in many, many situations, where the key thing is, if 
the metric here is in some sense naturally associated with the compactification here, where metric is related to V. There are many situations where the L2 cohomology, first of all, is finite dimensional and in fact equals a topological invariant not of the regular part but of the entire singular variety, namely the goresky mcpherson middle perversity intersection cohomology of V. And so um, when I said I was going to be looking at certain old results, these are the sort of results I'm going to look at. Uh, cross out that, right, V regular. These sort of results I'm going to look at, and I want to pinpoint one aspect of those proofs that involve a notion of weight. Um, the thing I want to be focusing on in this talk, um, there's a lot of analysis involved, but that's not going to be the focus. My focus is just on this notion of weight, and you can begin to see that quite well in situations where there's only isolated singularities. So when, I mean, of course, there's a lot of technical difficulties involved to transferring results from isolated singularities to general singularities, but that's not the subject of this talk. So when convenient. I will write down formulas and examples just for isolated singularities. So um, let's see, up. Yeah. So let me give my first example of the notion of weight, and it's the most obvious one uh, given our context, and I'll call it the metrical weight. Section two, metrical weights. So this is all heuristic, what I want to say, um, but it'll serve to define what I mean by a metrical weight. So let's say that X has the following form. It's a half line across a manifold L. Let's say X has dimension 2N, and so L has dimension 2n minus 1, and we compactify it by just adding in infinity. So this is x star, which will be x union, a point at infinity. Infinity in this variable, which I'm going to usually denote r. So um, let's assume that there's some sort of additional geometric structure on L so that its tangent bundle could be written as a direct sum of certain subbundles, and that the metric, that there's a Ramanian metric on L which has the form um, of the following. Here are these mu's. In this case, I'm going to assume are um, are, are, are real numbers greater than or equal to zero. And the metric is going to have the form the following, same sum over mu. There will be a metric on the L mu subbundle times a decaying factor, e to the minus 2 mu r. So in this case, I'm going to call mu, well, not, so, excuse me. The metric just decomposes into metrics on LU. I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> but now let's consider the metric. We could even set the metric on X to be the following, just the Euclidean metric in the R variable plus a warped version of the metric on L, namely direct sum of e to the minus 2 mu R ds squared L mu. So mu equals a metrical weight. And metrics like these are quite similar ones do occur. And um, so in this case, <clears throat> what's the heuristic I want to do? Um, uh, ah, so what I'll mean is 
if, if a tangent vector x belongs to L mu, we say it has weight minus mu. And if a one form belongs to the dual of L mu, we're going to say it has weight plus mu. And then if phi is a differential form, so it's in the wedge product um, of the cotangent space of x, we'll say it has weight mu if um, can be expressed as a sum of terms phi 1 wedge up to phi p. These are all one forms. And the sum of the weight of phi i equals mu. Okay. Uh, this one. OK. So here's the heuristic. I want to understand what the L2 cohomology of this might be. So okay. So say that phi is an I form, which is really pulled back from L. Well, then we can see that the norm squared of phi, the pointwise norm squared, is actually going to be equal to e to the 2 mu um, r, where this form phi has weight mu, times whatever the norm squared of phi is viewed as a differential form of L. And on the other hand, the volume form, <clears throat> dv on x, is going to equal e to the minus 2 rho r times dr wedge the volume form on L. And here this rho, rho is the half sum of all of the weights. So it's the sum over mu of, <clears throat> of, of mu times the dimension of L mu, because it occurs with multiplicity here. And then I want to put in a 1 half. You get rid of that 1 half when you put the 2 in there. <clears throat> yes? Yes, I apologize. I've used mu too many times. Um, over here, <clears throat> this is a certain set of mu's. And then if I have a differential form of higher degree, then I'm going to call its weight mu if, here, if this mu here is the sum of the mu's for each of these guys. Each of these guys belong to the dual of one of these things. So you just add in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but now I'm going to forget to do that for the next few slides. <laughs> Other questions? I usually have a lot more interaction, but in, in this context, maybe it's a little harder. OK, so <clears throat> here, there are some simple facts. So what do we see here? Yes. This mu, this mu, this mu, they're all the same. So this is going to be the metrical weight of a cotangent vector. Well, at the moment, they can be anything. But in, 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 in what's to come very soon, they'll be integers. But they could be anything. And so now I'm going to define a form to have a weight, which is the sum of the weights um, of, the, uh, uh, of the various cotangent vectors. And I'm assuming here that that sum will be the same for all such terms. So you could say this has pure weight, but I don't want to use that terminology. And uh, so now this is what I was calling new. I'll try. <laughs> 
But those are the same mu's. Is that clear now? But what this says is that the L2 norm of phi is equal to the integral over x of what? We have a contribution, an exponentially growing factor coming from the pointwise norm, e to the 2, mu. And we have an exponentially decaying factor coming from the volume form. They act against each other. So this is nu minus rho times the pointwise norm L dr dvl. Okay. So this will be finite if and only if that's negative. So nu is less than rho. So this rho over here I might call the middle weight. And so for weights less than the middle weight, you could take a form of that weight on L, pull it to the cone, and you will get an L2 form. And if you did the analogous thing for weights greater than, equal to rho or greater, it would not be L2. Other questions? So, so the first heuristic that this tells you, that this suggests, it suggests that the L2 cohomology of our x, which is this half line cross L, is isomorphic to for i less than, um, sorry, sorry. It suggests that the L2 cohomology or rather, the part of the L2 cohomology that has weight nu, assuming such a thing makes sense, is equal to the part of the cohomology of L that has weight nu. And this will only be true when nu is less than rho. And what else can you have? Well, separation of variables perhaps says you should have 0 if nu is greater than or equal to rho. This is not quite right, obviously. This is too crude. The thing that is seriously being left out of that is if you have a form on L that when you pull back to the whole cone is L2, and you wedge it with, say, anything times dr, where that's maybe with compact support, you're going to get also get something that's L2. And if you look at that R factor, it's a fact that the L2 cohomology of the half line is infinite dimensional. So here there's no weighting. So this is going this sort of thing is going to occur here when nu is equal to rho. There will be no weight. And if there's a dr in there, you're going to be contributing some infinite dimensional contribution to the L2 cohomology. So really, the correct heuristic statement is that the L2 cohomology of x in weight nu, there's three possibilities. It's the cohomology of the link when the weight is less than rho. It's infinite dimensional tensor, the cohomology of the link one degree lower. That's to take care of the dr of L. Wait, nu, that's when nu equals rho. And it's 0 when nu is greater than rho. Obviously, none of that's been proven, but let's just go on. So, we were looking for an isomorphism with intersection homology. Well, what is the intersection homology of this x star? Intersection cohomology, middle perversity of x star is equal to um, the cohomology of the link in the same degree for i uh, 
always want to make sure I get it in the right place, strictly less than the middle dimension, one half the dimension of x. And it's 0 for i greater than or equal to n. So these two things are just not equal for big reasons, potentially. So why would they be not equal? Well, if there is some cohomology class that has weight, sorry, let's go here. If there's some cohomology class that has weight greater than rho, but its degree is less than n, then these are not going to work. So to hope that these would be isomorphic, that's got to vanish. And similarly, if there's a cohomology class on the link that has weight less than rho, but it's in degree bigger than or equal to n, again, these are not going to agree. And no matter what, if there's a cohomology class with weight nu equals rho, you've got to get rid of it in order to hope for some isomorphism here. So therefore, to have um, L2 cohomology in this case of x isomorphic to the intersection cohomology of x star, you need a result. And now this is not analysis anymore. This is either topological or geometrical on L. And so this talk, I'm not going to be talking about the analysis that underlies this. I want to talk instead about the geometry. What you need is something I'm going to call a semi-purity theorem. And for reasons that will become more apparent later, you could also call it a Lefschetz type theorem. Okay, so this, I'm putting it in quotes because I'm not stating even hypothetically a theorem. This is the result, however, you would need to get the identity. You would need that the ith cohomology of L in weight nu, I'm remembering to use nu, it's pretty good, equals 0. Yes. If, um, if you are in greater or equal to the middle degree and you are in weight, less than or equal to rho, or you are in degree less than the middle and the weight is greater than or equal to rho. Notice when nu equals rho, no matter what, you need to have vanishing. So want to just keep that in mind for the entire talk because we're going to have to see in many cases um, why this might be true. So let me um, go over here. So let me talk about another a situation where there's another type of weight, and these are Lie theoretic weights, or representation theoretic weights. So I want G as a semi-simple Lie group. And D, uh, K, maximal compact subgroup. And D, I'll denote the corresponding symmetric space with the invariant metric. Okay, well, I mean, G could have some compact factors, but this isn't going to make much, uh, be of much interest unless G is actually non compact. Um, I'm going to look at a certain subgroup of G. I'll write M, A, N. This is a parabolic subgroup. And I'll give you an example of what that means. <clears throat> and I'm going to assume for simplicity, remember I said when needed, I'll just focus on uh, isolated singularities, or this is more uh, one, one singular uh, uh, stratum, I'm going to assume that the dimension of A here is 1. So what are these things? This M is also going to be semi-simple or reductive. That just means it's semi-simple cross um, a torus. 
This A is going to be a one-dimensional split torus, so it's isomorphic to R star, or rather, it's the connected component of it, so R greater than zero. And this N is going to be unipotent. And we've got the Lie algebra of this. P is equal to fractor M A N. And so let's give an example. Oh, I have to do it by hand. Okay. So example, say, when G equals S L N R. And we pick a K greater than 0 and less than N. And we have the following. So this M factor could be a block matrix. Here we have S L K. So this is the Lie algebra of SLN, so it's trace zero matrices. Here we have SLN minus K, 0, 0. So that's M. Direct sum A, get the coefficients right. It's going to be scalar matrices in the two blocks, and I'll do it N minus K over N times I, and then uh, negative, negative K over N times i, and again, 0, 0. So that's, sorry, that I'll call this element h, and I want to look at all real multiples of it. So this is my one-dimensional Lie algebra a. And n is just block upper triangular nilpotent matrices like that. So. What do we want to consider now? The fact is, is that A acts semi-simply. It's diagonalizable. It's going to act semi-simply on this whole Lie algebra by the adjoint action. And these eigenvalues the eigenvalues I'm going to call the, the Lie theoretic weights. So you can, uh, <clears throat> how about the eigenvalues of our generator here, so I don't have to talk about dual vectors. The eigenvalues of H will be the Lie weights. You can rescale such that the weights are going to belong to the set 0, 1, 2, etc. And in this case of SLN, what do we have? Well, these two commute, so you've got weight 0 here, you have weight 0 here, and then it's easy to check that the action of this on this is going to have weight 1. Weights 0 and 1. OK, so what does this have to do with that? Well, <clears throat> I'll note that g is equal to p times k. Uh, I teach linear algebra. That's Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization. So what that means is that when I form the corresponding symmetric space, I can form it using just P. So X, which is, G, uh, I called it D, which is G mod K, is P mod P intersect K. And now we have a decomposition. Using this decomposition of P, I have a decomposition into three factors, D, P, cross A, cross N, where this is M mod M intersect K. And, no. Oh. This is a symmetric space. It has the corresponding symmetric metric. What is the metric? Well, back in the 60s, Burrell wrote it down that the metric on D is up to some choices, is essentially the symmetric metric on DP plus the metric on this A, which I'm going to again call dr squared. I'll use the coordinate r on the Lie algebra 
which is isomorphic by the exponential map with A, and then a sum over weights, mu greater than or equal to 1, I've rescaled so they're all integers, of e to the minus 2 mu r times a metric on the corresponding weight space in the Lie algebra of n, n mu. So we have something looking like over here. And I'll just remark, that's a symmetric space. What I really want to be talking are locally arithmetic locally symmetric spaces. So if gamma in G is an uh, arithmetic subgroup, x equaling gamma quotient of d by gamma, and I'm going to assume and p is defined over q. So really, I'm assuming here that g are the real points of an algebraic group defined over the rationals. <clears throat> then you can form this, and you find out that there's a subset within here in which uh, for r large, say greater than c, and in this subset, this product decomposition persists. So when you take quotient by the arithmetic group, um, you can mix things around, but if you're, close, if you're near infinity here, you still get a product decomposition. And what the product decomposition, well, no, you get a bundle, really. You get a flat bundle over the base, which is xp. That's dp modulo gamma intersect p. And the fiber is r greater than or equal to c cross the corresponding arithmetic quotient of n, n mod gamma intersect n. This is a compact nil manifold. So now, if we pick a point here and look at its fiber, we have exactly the situation in the previous section. And we have a metric, the, local, the, the uh, induced from the locally symmetric metric, that has exactly this sort of decay. <clears throat> so what is that telling us? Well, it's the first thing I wanted to get to, that these metrical weights, which gave us a heuristic understanding of L2 cohomology are actually equal to Lie theoretic rate, weights. Question? OK, tell me where I made the mistake again. Yes is going to be dp modulo uh, gamma intersect p modulo gamma intersect n. Thank you. I'm trying not to get too bogged down in all of this stuff. Now, all, and all you can generalize to situations where the dimension of A is greater than 1. So maybe let me give an aside before I get to the main application. Here we have a nice situation. These, these um, d mod gamma, these are locally symmetric manifolds. They've got a metric. We could look at their L2 cohomology. Well, the L2 cohomology of d mod gamma is often infinite dimensional. So you're not getting any sort of uh, topological interpretation, even though the metric is complete. Because these zero weights that I talked about can often occur. In a second, I'm going to talk about a situation where they don't occur. But turns out, again, this is a little off to the side, but there is a topological interpretation 
of the L2 harmonic forms is a theorem I proved a few years ago that there is a compactification, uh, that this is actually isomorphic to the image of the intersection co uh, cohomology, um, lower middle perversity of a compactification called the reductive borel sayer Reductive borel sayer now does not just have even dimensional strata, so you have to look at upper and lower, and you map that naturally into the upper middle perversity, and that image gives you the L2 harmonic forms um, with a proviso which should be removed, and G has no E8 factor. Okay, but so I, I wanted to mention that there are things you can do here, but th this theorem is sort of off to the side of what I wanted to talk about. So I'm just going to leave that there and go on to the main application of this. Um, I guess up there. So I've, here we've got a context where I've given an interpretation of metrical weights as Lie theoretic weights, maybe that can be used to prove some sort of theorem like this. And yes, it can. So uh, the application here was a result first conjectured by Zucker and then proven by myself in collaboration with Mark Stern and at the same time by Eduard Leungha. <coughs> So, oh, I don't have to four. And so let me just mention how this fits into this general context. So now we're going to assume that D is Hermitian symmetric. So just doing that is going to remove this infinite dimensionality possibility, it turns out. But we need more than that to get what we want. So the thing I need to know is, is that you can refine the decomposition of P. Using the Hermitian structure, I've got MAN. So I can rewrite that now as MH, ML. So this is together as M, A. And then the unipotent radical I'll write as V times U. That's N. <clears throat> so I'm not going to give the precise um, definitions of these, but just suffice it to say, this is now a reductive group whose corresponding symmetric space is again Hermitian symmetric. This, so this is Hermitian type. This is linear type. So it's something like SLN of R or SLN of C, so on. And then this splitting corresponds to different weights, as I will indicate in a moment. <clears throat> well, I'll indicate right now. This is going to correspond to weight one, and this is weight two. And those are the only weights. I had a dot, 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 but in the Hermitian symmetric case, those are the only weights that occur. So we get that the Hermitian symmetric space now has a decomposition into a smaller rank Hermitian symmetric space, um, something like the symmetric space associated to SLN, um, our split torus, our V, and our U. And as A and A tends to infinity, what we're going to do is we're going to adjoin to this symmetric space a copy of DPH. So as you go to infinity in the A direction, namely um, in the order of uh, increasing higher, in the order of positive multiples of this H, as you go to infinity, then these factors disappear, and all that's left at infinity is DPH. 
do for all such p, and you get a new space, d star, which is d disjoint union, all of these dphs. Now, um, I haven't given you a topology. To create a topology on this thing, you have to look at not just these maximal parabolic subgroups, but you have to look at smaller parabolic subgroups where the A has higher dimension. And that's how you would glue these together, and I'm not going to do that. But to get topology, um, use all. This is for P maximal. Use all P. Once you have that topology, then you get, we'll set x star. E, ah, and I should also say this is P defined over Q. We're going to get d star modulo gamma. It turns out the arithmetic group is still going to act on this. It's going to act on these things at infinity. <clears throat> and this is called the bailey borel satake compactification. So it's a uh, projective algebraic variety. And the strata are corresponding quo arithmetic quotients of these lower rank symmetric spaces. Let me give some examples. which will be important later. So as I said, I'm feeling free to give examples that are only in, say, in isolated singularities. So I'll do the following. say, isolated singularities and focus on a neighborhood U containing X singular. So I want to describe what's the topology. I want to describe what the Lie algebra P is. I want to recall what the metric is, but that should be deduced from what I've said before. And I'm going to give uh, a desingularization, a resolution. So I'll leave out the easiest example of the upper half plane because it'll be inherent in some of the ones I give. <clears throat> How about a um, quotient of a two ball? So the topology here is going to be a half line across a link, and the link is just an S1 bundle over E, where that's an elliptic curve. And let's see. Um, I don't know where it went. Ah, there. So I want to look at the Lie algebra of that five-factor decomposition. I'll forget the first factor. I'm just looking at an isolated singularity. And what I've got here is I've got A, of course, and I've got V, and I've got U. And in this case, U is the tangent space of that S1 fiber. <clears throat> and, um, and this V is the tangent space of E. And this is the tangent space of the line going to infinity. So the metric, of course, is going to be dr squared plus e to the minus r ds squared on e. That base, uh, sorry, e to the minus 2r plus e to the minus 4r d theta squared. This is a hop vibration, so it's non-degenerate. 
complex analytically, the singularity is the complex cone over uh, the elliptic curve. So that's a situation where E comes in. Um, sorry? What I meant by the hop vibration is this is a projective variety. And so over complex projective space, you have the hop vibration um, of, uh, over n space, you have the hop vibration of Cn plus 1 minus the origin. And then if you restrict that to some subvariety, you get a, what I was calling the hop vibration over this. Oh, and of course, I am intersecting with the ball. If you throw this in, then, okay, so let me not call it the hot vibration. <laughs> but it can be deduced from it, right? So um, another very useful example is H cross H. These are two copies of the upper half plane. Modulo um, SL of the ring of integers of some real quadratic extension of the rationals. And so this SL2 here, so SL2 of z would act on h and on h. Here, you embed the real, um, the, the ring of integers into r in the two different conjugate fashions and let that act on the, and use those to act differently on the two different factors. This is called the Hilbert modular variety. So what does it look like topologically? Again, a line going off to infinity across a link. And here, the link again is a bundle, but an entirely different kind of bundle. It is a flat bundle over uh, a circle in this case, and the fiber being the product of two circles. And you can see that in the picture I'm about to give. We have A. Okay. We do not have a V factor. We have U, which is the tangent space of those two circles. And then we have uh, what I called up there ML. ML. And that's the tangent space of this S1 at the bottom. And so here, this has weight 0. So we have. Um, I'll write it dt squared. I'll let uh, t be a coordinate on that base, L1, uh, base S1. And then I'll have e to the minus 4r d theta 1 squared plus d theta 2 squared. And if we were just looking at the upper half plane, um, I wouldn't have this. I would just have one S1 here. I'd have L would, in fact, just be S1, and I would have dr squared plus e to the minus 4r d theta squared, or dx squared, as you wish. Ah, resolution. Here, this is a complex cone. When you blow up the singular point, you just get a single exceptional divisor. It becomes smooth. That exceptional divisor is the elliptic curve. And here, Hirzebruck gave you a resolution by forming a rational decomposition of a cone in the, in the imaginary plane of this. And using that partition, you can get a resolution where you get a cycle of rational curves. So this is maybe the beginning of the theory of smooth, compact, smooth toroidal compactifications of locally symmetric spaces, but it was done much earlier. So, those are, I think those are two examples, and um, maybe I'll just say, let me just quickly indicate the general case. So the general case is going to have all five of those factors. I'm leaving out the first because that corresponds to, uh, since I'm looking at isolated singularities, I'm assuming that that first factor is just a point. But it's going to have all the other factors, and we're going to have um, iterated bundles, several iterated bundles. So general, well, again, it's r greater than 0 cross l. l has a flat bundle 
over XL, fiber compact N, and uh, and N itself is going to fiber over A, which is an abelian variety, with fiber some power of the circle. And I won't write down the metric, but you can see you, this is going to have weight 0, this will have weight 2, this will have weight 1. This generalizes the E, um, this generalizes the S1. <coughs> Ah, so I should give the theorem, though. Forgetting these examples, the theorem, the Zucker conjecture, to Saper and Stern, and Loinka. And a few years later, just a couple of years later, a new proof by Loinka and Rapoport that actually is very relevant to this discussion, that um, the L2 cohomology of D mod gamma is isomorphic to the intersection cohomology of D star mod gamma. Okay. So we've got that the metrical weights are the same. I've, I've at least motivated they're the same as the Lie theoretic weights. So what we need is we need some analysis, which I'm not going to discuss, and we need some sort of argument, this semi-purity result, which has disappeared, unfortunately, on the possible Lie theoretic weights that are occurring. And um, so where does semi-purity come from? So in the Saper-Stern proof, we proved it directly via combinatorial study using some combinatorics of the wild group um, on the weights appearing. So it's just done out of the basic structure theory of Hermitian symmetric spaces. In Edward's proof, so it's following the same philosophy. At first glance, people thought, oh, these two proofs are so different. But no, it's following the exact same philosophy except what he's doing through, um, basically, he's going from metrical weights to Lee weights, like I just did. But then, essentially, goes to the weights of a of a local HECA operator, but the final line are the weights of a mixed Hodge structure, which is important for other things I wanted to say, which I may not have time to say. And, um, and then he uses, basically he's using the decomposition theorem in algebraic geometry. which is due to Balenson, Bernstein, and uh, Gaber, and another proof by Saito. But in this first proof, he's also using work of Katani Kaplan Schmidt. And um, uh, it, it, the, the Loincha Rapoport proof is more streamlined and emphasizes weights a lot more. But in the end, it goes down to mixed Hodge theory and uses um, Saito's results. So, the next thing I wanted to do is talk about mixed Hodge theory and the weights that I appeared that, that appear there. Um, but I'm running out of time, I think, right? Two minutes? Okay. One minute. Okay. <clears throat> See, I, that'll take, give me enough time to erase a board. <laughs> so, so let me say this. Sorry. Um, so, <clears throat> Deline has a theory of mixed Hodge theory. <clears throat> Cohomology of the ith cohomology of a compact Kähler manifold has a PQ decomposition. That's a Hodge structure. In general, the cohomology of a singular variety or a non-compact variety has a mixed Hodge structure. There's a filtration, and the ith cohomology, when you look at the associated graded of the filtration, has each of those associated graded pieces have Hodge structures of different weights. The link of a singularity also has a mixed Hodge structure. And from the decomposition theorem, you can prove 
um, something actually stronger than the semi-purity result I was asking for. And so you have, say for an isolated singularity, you have a restriction on what weights occur in the mixed Hodge structure of the link of an isolated singularity. And um, so the next application I was going to talk about is a very, very old result of mine where I constructed metrics on arbitrary isolated singularities, which micro-locally were perturbations of these metrics. And I was able to show the standard result that the L2 cohomology was equal to the intersection cohomology. And that was by an ad hoc method of coming, of looking at the weight spectral sequence for the L2 cohomology via an ad hoc notion of weight connecting it to mixed Hodge structure using that result following from the decomposition theorem. I should say that for the case of this cone, where E is the elliptic curve, this whole decomposition theorem, semi-purity, this just boils down to the hard Lefschetz theorem. That's why I was calling it the hard Lefschetz earlier. And for the case of a surface, it comes down to Grauert's uh, criterion for blowing down a divisor and the negative definiteness of the intersection matrix. So using that, I could prove a corresponding result for arbitrary isolated singularities. Um, I'd like to generalize that to non-isolated singularities. I could do it the very same way. It would be a lot of work, but I'm more interested in trying to do it um, a better way, a more uh, inherent way. And so I want to use CR geometry because the links of these singularities have a CR structure. And if you look at the links in the locally symmetric space and you look at the CR structure, you can concoct an operator from pseudo-Hermitian geometry whose eigenvalues will be the Lie theoretic weights. And so at least for locally symmetric spaces, I can relate this to some notion involving CR geometry. For a general isolated singularity, um, it's far more difficult, but I have an idea about how to do it. Um, using that notion of weight, you might want to try to construct a mixed Hodge structure on the cohomology of a, a CR manifold and some sort of semi-purity theorem. Work has been done in the so-called normal case, but this is too simple. That the normal case corresponds to the complex cone over the elliptic curve. And thank you for your patience. I think I'd better end there. Thank you. So we can have one or two short questions. Any questions? OK, let's thank. Oh. I, I said two things. I said the method I already used in the isolated case could probably, with a lot of painful work, be pushed forward. But instead, I would prefer to push it forward to the non-isolated case using a new method involving CR geometry. And, but even more importantly, instead of appealing to the decomposition theorem of proving the Lefschetz theorem directly in CR geometry. So that's just part of my ongoing program right now. So. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.